Hasbro and Mattel are two companies that sound like a lot of fun, but there's been an intense competition happening between them going back multiple decades. Each of them has spent time as the largest toy maker in the world, so I think it's safe to say that just about everybody watching this has bought or at least played with something made by one of them. I'll get more specific about it as the video goes on, but just know that when you look through a toy store, or I guess more commonly today, the toy aisle, most of what you see is currently made by either Mattel or Hasbro. Speaking of toys, stores, when Toys R Us shut down in 2018, they both had a significant drop in sales. See, actually, Mattel had already been struggling, likely in part because some of their core brands, including the famous Barbie doll, hadn't been selling quite as well as they had hoped. So after trailing for almost 25 years, Hasbro pulled ahead of Mattel in 2017. When they both fell the following year, Hasbro did maintain their lead from that point, but it's pretty much been neck and neck, as far as sales anyway. There have been a lot of contributing factors, but as far as net income, Hasbro has been the clear winner recently. And as far as their performance on the stock market, again, Hasbro has done much better. Technically, they're worth almost twice as much as Mattel, and over the last few years have been the smarter investment. So for today, I want to talk about how these two have grown and evolved into what they are, while highlighting some of the key similarities and differences between them. It would only make sense to start with the formation, and for both of them, I think it's interesting that they started as family companies, but oddly enough, did not start by making toys. The name Hasbro comes from the Hassenfeld brothers. They had immigrated to the US from Poland and in 1923 started a textile remnant business. When you cut cloth to make clothes or whatever you're making, you end up with all these leftover scraps and they would sell them. It was a small business, but they saw bigger opportunity for it. They quickly started using the leftover materials to make covers for pencil boxes, which then led them to making these pouches filled with school supplies and after about 15 years of selling those primarily to children, they made the logical transition into making toys, primarily for children. They made a variety of them early on, but their first true success, the one that we all still recognize today, was Mr. Potato Head. It was much different at first, you had to supply your own potato, but it was pioneering in that it was the first ever toy to be advertised on television. Another interesting thing that I want to mention is around that same time when they started making toys, they also started making pencils. They used to buy them from a supplier to put into those school supply kits, but to raise profits, they started making them themselves, which later proved to be a really helpful part of their toy business. You know, with toys, you have to keep up with trends and innovate new ones. It can be a shaky business, but pencils are pretty standard. So for the next 35 years, whenever something would go bad with the toys, they always had the pencil end of things to provide stability. Now, Mattel was a family business in that it was started by a husband and wife team named Elliot and Ruth Handler. Before Mattel, they were all over the place. They had started businesses making light fixtures and furniture and costume jewelry. But in 1945, they got together with a friend of theirs named Harold Matson and started Mattel as a combination of two of their names, Matson and Elliot, though Matson did leave the business early on. I guess as a side similarity, the names Mattel and Hasbro were both created by combining two different words. And even then, they still weren't making toys. Mattel originally made picture frames. Elliot was using the leftover wood to make little dollhouse furniture, and that sparked the transition into toys. And much like Hasbro, they were also pioneering in advertising on television. Hasbro was the first to do it, but Mattel was the first to do it big. They didn't just buy your typical commercial, they actually sponsored an entire segment on a children's show called the Mickey Mouse Club. They signed an incredibly expensive one-year deal that probably would have killed them had it not worked out so well. That's how their name first got out there in a big way, they advertised a lot of musical toys on the show, but their first true hit toy was in 1959 with the Barbie doll. There's too much that could be said about this, but it did big things for Mattel. It's been called the most popular toy of all time, and for the last 60 years or so, it's remained their best-selling brand. Now, for Hasbro, the Hassenfelds have remained involved over the years. They were always led by a member of the family up until 2003, and even today, still remain partial owners. Sadly, that has not been the case for Mattel. The handlers were pretty much forced away from the company in the 1970s, following Ruth's potential involvement in an accounting scandal. As for a 
another similarity, around the 1970s, in order to expand their business, they both tried to do it by diversifying. I'm talking about introducing all of these new toys and games and getting involved in other children-related businesses. Here, for Hasbro, in 1969, they bought a TV production company that made a popular children's show called Romper Room. They then took it a step further by opening a chain of daycares named after the show. But then, by the end of the decade, they had sold that daycare business and cut down on their product lines to better focus on their better selling ones. For Mattel, all of this was a little bit delayed, but they became even more diversified. All in the 1970s, they bought Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus, a major children's book publisher called Western Publishing, and introduced a new video game console called Intellivision. Again, there's a lot that could be said about all of this, but none of it really worked out. They were unfocused, the video game market crashed, they were losing money, so throughout the 1980s, they worked towards selling those other ventures, and much like Hasbro, refocused their efforts toward their best-selling, most stable products. But remember, Hasbro had already gone through all of this a little bit earlier, so right when Mattel was at the height of their struggles, Hasbro was already recovering, to a point where in 1984, they were in a position where they were able to buy a major competitor named Milton Bradley for $360 million. It gave them possession of all of these board games like Yahtzee and the Game of Life, which raised their sales the following year and helped Hasbro pass Mattel as the largest toy company in the world. That did not last long though. The industry had already been consolidating and throughout the 1990s, Hasbro and Mattel started acquiring seemingly every major competitor that they could afford. I guess to make a game analogy, they were like hungry, hungry hippos, feverishly competing to see who could gobble up more of their competitors. A game that was acquired by Hasbro as part of that Milton Bradley deal, by the way. There could be separate videos about most of these companies, but here are the basics. In 1991, Hasbro acquired Tonka for 480 $86 million. And of course, you know the name Tonka from their Tonka trucks, but due to previous deals, they were also the owners of Monopoly, Nerf, and Play-Doh. Mattel's answer to all of these board game acquisitions was to acquire international games, most notably the makers of Uno the following year. Then, they made a bigger acquisition when they bought Fisher Price, the maker of toys for young children, for over $1 billion, and it remains one of their biggest sales categories today. Now, that was the move that helped pull Mattel back ahead of Hasbro, which, as I said in the beginning, Beginning, it remained that way until 2017. In the following year, they strengthened that lead by acquiring Kransko, the maker of Power Wheels, the Hula Hoop, and the Frisbee. In 1995, Hasbro answered back by acquiring their own maker of outdoor toys, Laramie Corporation, the makers of the Super Soaker. Mattel answered that one the following year by acquiring Tyco for over $700 million. They were the makers of Magna Doodle, Viewmaster, and a bunch of official Sesame Street toys. There's more to go. In fact, 1998 may have been their busiest year. That was the year Hasbro acquired Tiger Electronics, who made one of the best-selling toys at the time, the Furby. And they bought Galoob Toys, who made Micro Machines, and they happened to be the only other company licensed to sell Star Wars toys from the original trilogy. It's a little complex, but Hasbro already had licensing rights, so this gave them the exclusive rights. On the other end, still in 1998, Mattel spent another $700 million to buy Pleasant Company, the makers of the American Girl brand. Then, to wrap up this list, in 1999, Hasbro acquired Wizards of the Coast, the makers of Magic the Gathering and, at the time, the newly popular Pokemon trading card game. Also, right in the middle of this, in 1996, Mattel was actually trying to merge together with Hasbro. I know, things were getting out of hand. It would have been a $5.2 billion deal. Mattel felt that this would be beneficial on both sides, in that they can combine their production capabilities and their marketing efforts. They even estimated the savings to be over $100 million for the first year, but Hasbro was confident that the deal wouldn't be approved by the government for concerns of, ironically, a monopoly. So they ended up declining that deal to avoid dealing with that process, and it really just doesn't seem like they were too interested anyway. But over 20 years later, in 2017, reports surfaced that Hasbro was now trying to buy Mattel. Obviously that one hasn't happened either, but there are constant rumors about it, and considering that there's been a couple of legitimate attempts, we may see this happen one day. Continuing with the time, Timeline, another similarity that I'd like to point out is their early failed attempts to expand into computer games. If we look back at their profits, around the year 2000, they both took a drastic turn and this was the main reason behind it. Considering how much the internet was taking off around that time, it seemed logical enough for these game companies to, you know, start making computer games. In 1995, Hasbro started this software division where they were making computerized versions of their existing games and later started making this gaming website simply called Games.com. But by the year 
2000, they had become unpopular and were losing millions of dollars each year. They ultimately sold it all the following year, and things were even worse for Mattel. With similar intentions, they bought The Learning Company for $3.5 billion, which I believe remained the biggest acquisition either one of them had ever been a part of until Hasbro's 2019 acquisition of Entertainment One. The Learning Company was responsible for some popular computer games at the time, mostly educational, but much like what happened with Hasbro, they were quickly becoming unpopular and less profitable. In the end, they lost hundreds of millions of dollars on the deal when they sold it the following year. Both companies have been involved in other computer and video games since then, but nothing as major or disastrous, and to my knowledge, has never amounted to a significant portion of their business. So there we have it. That's my comparison of two of the largest and most directly competing toy companies that the world has ever seen. And just a few additional comparisons that I feel I should mention that didn't quite fit into the narrative. Historically, one of the biggest toys for Mattel has been Hot Wheels, introduced in 1968 and as of 2019, still accounts for 18% of their sales. For Hasbro, they're behind G.I. Joe. Introduced in 1964, it once accounted for the majority of their sales. However, it didn't quite have the same staying power as Hot Wheels. It's since been rebranded and discontinued and brought back. They don't report sales on it specifically, but I think it's safe to say that it hasn't been significant for them for maybe 50 years now. Also, licensing rights. Most of it has changed over the years, but generally, Hasbro has had the rights to make the Star Wars and Marvel toys, whereas Mattel has had the Warner rights, such as the DC and Harry Potter characters. Again, it's not perfect, but that's the rule that has worked most of the time. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of these two companies, specifically how they've evolved and what they look like today? I wanted to ask which one you prefer as a toy maker, but honestly, since so much of what they make has been obtained through these acquisitions, I don't see much of an identity coming through. For most of it, it's hard to tell who even makes it without searching for a logo somewhere. Maybe instead I'll ask, what is your favorite product to come from either one of them? Personally, I've been known to play a pretty decent game of Hasbro's Connect 4. Pretty sneaky, sis. So any other thoughts you have about these companies or their products, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.